Tonight's pick out some pretty good songs. To go with the lesson this evening, not knowing what the lesson is, other than what the title is, Three Motives to Be Faithful, and I think you'll see why I believe he picked out some good songs as we go down through this lesson. But we will talk about three motives to be faithful. The basis of it, Revelation 14, 12, and 13, we're not going to look at that immediately, but understand that the way the Bible is set up and what God's Word reveals to us in His plan of salvation, it is structured in such a way that a person can be lost intentionally. In other words, a person can intentionally choose to disobey or not believe in and disobey God and, and in the same sense no one can be or a, a person can be lost by accident can be lost by accident in other words they, they, they just don't spend the time or you know they're not careful and they just step in the wrong directions and they're lost but no person can be saved by accident no person can go to heaven by accident there has to be something that we do there has to be a course that we pursue there are motives for us to pursue that course of behavior to fulfill God's plan of salvation, but we simply cannot get on that road of salvation by accident. We have to do things intentionally. So what are some of the motives that would inspire people to become children of God and serve and worship Him faithfully throughout their lives? We're going to look at three of those motives this evening. Uh, reasons or motives why people would surrender themselves or, or, uh, surrender their lives to Jesus Christ and the first motive is love and the reason that the first motive is love because it's really of first importance now I know the Apostle Paul says in 1st Corinthians chapter 15 that uh, it was the first importance in preaching and teaching that the gospel be applied. But remember, the gospel is applied because of love. The great agape love of God. In Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 38, Jesus kind of explains this. That he was asked a question, what is the greatest commandment? Because the scholars back at that time, the religious people, they'd sit around and say, well, you know, we got ten commandments in the law of Moses. Which one's the greatest? Which one's the most important? And, and typically we'd say, well, it'd have to be the first one because it's the first one given. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God, and you shall have no other gods before him. They, uh, that's got to be very important. But again, that motive of love is the topic that Jesus used to explain what is great because the Ten Commandments are based on two types of love. Okay, listen to this. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? He said to him, You shall love the Lord the God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And then he goes on to say that the second commandment is likened to it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, that's what the Ten Commandments are. You have how to uh, get along with God or how to love God, do things out of love for God. And then the last part of the Ten Commandments is how you get along with, how you love your fellow man, other people. So Jesus talks about love as being uh, this great thing that will actually help us to get all of the commandments correct, doing God's will correctly. It is just not possible to please God by merely making verbal affirmation of his existence. You know, if we say, yeah, I believe in God, but then nothing happens because of it, if it doesn't change our lives, if it doesn't make us like Him, like His Son in the things that we do, then really 
those keeping those commandments won't help us. It didn't help the Jews. You know, they 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 kept track of it. They knew which ones they broke and which ones they didn't break. They knew when they were keeping it. And they liked to say, hey, here's here's what we've done good. You know, they were very proud of their righteousness, so proud that it became a self-righteousness. And they refused to, uh, eventually refused to accept responsibility for the commandments that they broke but boy, they would put the pressure on other people and were quick, quick to point out, hey, you are a sinner because you broke this commandment. But there must exist in our life a, a love for God that causes us to reach out to Him, to seek Him, to, to do His will. Uh, and because duty alone will not do it. We talked this morning about Ecclesiastes 12, 13. Here the whole, the conclusion of the matter, fear God and keep his commandments. Well, yeah, fear God. Uh, they needed to have a fear of God. But, you know, along the lines, that fear becomes a love for God, and love is a greater motivator than fear. You know why? When we're children, uh, we fear our parents because if they give us some corporal punishment every now and then, then, you know, we kind of think, you know, I don't want to do that because I don't want to get a spanking or I don't want to get stood in the corner or anything of that nature. But as they grow older, that fear goes away. And if we haven't taught them love, if we haven't showed them how to love, then they're going to have a lot of problems later on in life. It's love. Love for our Lord. Love for our parents. Love for our families. Love for our communities. Love for our nation. Love for the church. That will get us to do things for the church, even, that uh, most people won't do. Uh, I think we've talked before. Let many people in church feel that they're volunteers. Hey, I'm just a volunteer. I'm just here. You take care of me. When Jesus doesn't call for volunteers, he calls for disciples. He calls for people to live that life daily. So when it comes to church and to our worship services, to Bible study and such, it's real important. Love will take care of the problem. Remember the story of the old lady? She was about, what, 95 years old and never missed a worship service or a Bible study. Just never. And somebody was so amazed. Uh, man, how do you do that? You're just always here. You never miss. And she says, well, I can tell you this. My heart gets there first and then my feet follow. Amen. And that's the way it is in life. It, it, if we don't like it, we're going to be miserable at it. Have you ever had a job that you just didn't like and you were miserable? You wanted out of it, right? So, you know, sometimes you just get in that job and you've got to find the things that make you like it and you want to be there more than just the pay. But, but you find those reasons. And that, see, love is such a great motivator. So we seek Him, we seek God every day. We seek Him throughout the day because of love. Well, why is love so important? Well, for everything compatible with serving God in a pleasing manner is conditioned upon our loving God and our fellow, our fellow man. Again, Matthew chapter 22, verse 40. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Which was that? Well, the ones we talked about before. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, if, if we can do that, we're going to take a great step toward being faithful children of God. So these two commandments under consideration were loving God, loving others, our, our neighbors as ourselves. Well, look at Galatians chapter 5, verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Faith working through love. If we would say we have faith, but we don't have love, our faith is dead. You know why? Because James, James had it really close, and, and you know we're not going to say that James was wrong. He was inspired by the Holy Spirit. He said faith without works is dead. Well, why would the works be absent? Lack of love, right? 
a lack of love. Love is that motivating factor to reach out to others. <coughs> First Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. Have you ever really noticed what is said here, what Paul is saying? He says, If I speak in tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Did you ever have somebody hear somebody say something like this? But I love you, brother! Amen. Sure doesn't sound like it, does it? But, but yet they say, yeah, I love you, and that's why I do these terrible things to you, because I love you. No, that's, that, that just doesn't work that way. But it's, that sounded like a clanging cymbal, didn't it? That's something just, it, and, and you know what it is. And I know, I can't help that I sing. I sing prisoner behind a few bars and looking for the key, okay? And sometimes my voice clashes, okay? It just does. So, but when somebody shouts like that in kind of an angry tone that I love you, the message is incomplete. It's like a clanging cymbal. It's out of key. It's out of step. And, you know, that can happen in families, too. You know, when the father says, it's going to hurt me more than it hurts you, son, it rarely does it ever. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. And, but sometimes children begin to think that that type of abuse is love. And it's not. 1 Corinthians chapter, again, 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Hey, that sounds like the Pharisees, doesn't it? Scribes and Pharisees and doctors of the law that Jesus clashed with, okay? And remember, their personalities clashed because they knew all this stuff, but they didn't practice it. They didn't. So, see, they were out of step. And so when Jesus comes along, and he not only knows it because he's the author of it, but he's practicing it and he's preaching and teaching it, they, they can't take it. He's out of harmony with us. It's, it's discord here. And they had to get rid of him. Well, it's the same way with us if we're not careful. We, our, our, our knowledge can overwhelm our just typical, normal, everyday reaching out and doing things for others. The showing of love to others. And Paul says, if I give away all I have... And if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Have you ever seen te television shows, movies, or whatever, back of the, when the persecution was rampant in, in Jerusalem and in other areas in Rome, how that sometimes people would volunteer, hey, I'm a Christian, take me, feed me to the lions, put me on a cross. Got people today that will do the same thing, won't they? When it comes... Passover time, which some people call Easter, okay? And you, you'll see it. You'll see it in the paper. So many people were crucified. They were nailed to a cross. You know, well, why were they doing that? To, to, to be like Jesus? If they didn't do that out of love, if they did that for fame or notoriety, they did it for the wrong reason. Yeah, that's what the... Uh, T.S. Eliot said, Myrtle, Murder in the Cathedral, a play that he wrote, The last temptation is the greatest treason, to do the right deed, but for the wrong reason. Whatever we do, we need to do it out of love, that agape love. And sometimes that agape love, meaning doing what's best for the other person, means that you don't do what they would typically think is the good because there's something missing in their life. It's better sometimes not to give to somebody to teach them the lesson that they're going to have to have better behavior. So, you know, the Apostle Paul puts it in pretty good order there. If we love God, 
things are going to go better for us. Without a strong love for God, the demands of God that God places upon us are simply too hard to keep. If, if, if a lacking of love for God, His commandments become a burden that we cannot fulfill. If we love God, obedience becomes a pleasure. Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek them. But how do you seek them? Seek them out of love, a desire to please God, and a desire to do good for others. Because, you know, if we're seeking the kingdom of God simply because we want to go to heaven, I'll tell you in a moment that that's a good motive, but yet we're not doing it for the right reason. If we do it to avoid hell, I'll talk about that in a moment. It's not a, the best reason. There still has to be a love, a love for God, and a love for, for our soul and the souls of others. Listen, what do you order when you go to a restaurant? Food. What you like. You order what you like. Yeah. Now, or what you think you will like. Okay? Because sometimes you, you order something new. Hey, that looks pretty good. I think I would like that, so I ordered that. How many people do you know go to a restaurant and order something that they know they're not going to like? Yeah. Well, with some people, they don't like what God has said. They don't like God's word. They don't like God's commandments. They don't like what God says we need to do to, to live a life that's pleasing to Him. They're not going to do it. But when we love God's word, we're going to do it. And, and some of that stuff that's there that, oh, hey, I didn't see that before. I'm going to do that because that's what God expects of me. That's how love becomes such a motive for our faithful living. John 14, 15, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Plain and simple. That, that's, that's his test that he puts before us. 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome if what? If we love God. Why should we love God? 1 John 4, 19, because he first loved us. That's one good reason. He's demonstrated his love for us. We ought to demonstrate on a daily basis our love for him. Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The free gift. Well, the free gift comes with conditions, though. You know, we don't have to pay anything to go to heaven, but we need to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. That's a condition, the condition of, of being obedient to God. So seeing what God has done for me, for you, for us, how can we not love him? Yeah. What one of us would want to give up one of our children to die for the world? I don't think so. I don't think I could do that. God the Father did that. God the Son went to the cross. That's, that's love. Second motive is heaven. That's why I say I appreciate those songs that we sang earlier. Mo heaven. And it, it wanting to go to heaven, not just that there's a heaven, but desiring to be there. We're strangers and aliens upon this earth. We're citizens of a higher kingdom, greater than our citizenship in the kingdoms of the world. So uh, there it is. And, you know, it's all right to talk about wanting to go to heaven. You know, psychologists and psychiatrists, counselors today, if you talk to them about wanting to go to heaven, they might want to examine your head, right? And uh, who was it, the lady on TV? Joy yeah, Behar. Uh, Joy Behar, you know, says, that's mental illness. Uh, <laughs> No, it's not. It's the only hope of getting out of this world alive. But we should be able to express it because it is a motivating force in our lives. Now, again, not absence of, absent of love, and love will bring us doing the commandments, but there is a, a, a better place, a perfect place. Father, 
and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. So heaven is rewarded. God gives his children because of their love and faithful service to him. John 14, 1 through 4, let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Again, the last night, uh, the night before Jesus is crucified, okay, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, dwelling places. Mansion's a word that uh, King James uses. It's not really that. It's kind of like an apartment uh, built on to God's house. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He wants us to be with him. He's cheering us on. The ones who are preparing to go there in paradise now in the Hadean realm, they're cheering us on. The angels are cheering us on. The good ones are, at least. we got all these people wanting us to be faithful. They're on our side. They want us, but we have to be faithful to be able to go to heaven. Look at the descriptions of heaven, kind of going through it, and God's word. Just there, there are many places, but just Revelations, Revelation 21 and 22. Okay, uh, it's perfect. A new heaven and a new earth, a place where sin does not exist, so there's not going to be any temptation there. Okay? Think of this world that we live in. Okay, And we understand that in the resurrection, there will be no male or female. We'll be like the angels. Kind of like genderless, okay? But sexless, okay? There won't be any procreation there because heaven's going to be full. Think of all the sin in the world today involving sexual activity. That's not going to be there. Wiped out. That would probably be half of what's in the world today. Greed would be half of the next half, see? They're precious gems. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2, and verses 18 through 21. Precious gems. Gold. The, uh, the streets are paved with gold. Gold is so worthless there, you throw it out on the streets and walk on. The Father and the Son are there, uh, verse 3 and verse 22 of uh, chapter 21. Eternal day, chapter 21, verse 23. The gates are always open, chapter 21, verse 25. You know what that means? Nobody's going to come in and attack. We, we, we have to have gates and we have to have borders. We have to have doors and locks in this world. We don't have to have it there. We don't have to fear anything. No death, Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, 22, verses 1 and 2. Why is that? Because the river of life is there and the tree of life is there. You drink from the water of life and you eat from the tree of life. There's no death. No dying. It's eternal life. No tears, no mourning, no crying, nor pain, Revelation chapter 21, and verse 4. That would be worth it in itself right there, right? Nothing unclean or detest, uh, detestable or false will be there. Revelation chapter 21, verse 27. The absence of those evil things. So God has painted a beautiful picture of what heaven is going to be like, and we ought to be determined to be faithful children of God so we can go there. Wanting to go there is a good motive, but that motive would push us to be faithful to God. What do you think the third motive is? There's a good motive to be a faithful child of God, and that's hell. Excuse me, and the existence of hell. And again, there's nothing wrong with expressing the, the desire not to go to hell. I don't want to go there. And what the Bible tells me about it, it's very descriptive. Matthew 25 or 24, 51, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 25, 10, it's total darkness. You don't know what you're bumping into down there or who you're bumping into. I guess maybe they don't even care. Jude 1.13, blackness of darkness is what it's called. 
Revelation 20.10, everlasting fire and brimstone. You know, it's, it's pretty tough these summers that we have when it gets dry and hot. And you get out and work in the sun for a while, you get pretty hot. Oh, that would be even hotter, wouldn't it? Terrible. Uh, Revelation 20.14, a lake of fire. It is eternal, everlasting, and without end. Everything that is evil and wicked and bad in this world will be in hell for eternity, only multiplied thousands of times over. It doesn't sound very tempting, does it? No. And that's one of the things that I've, I, you know, when I hear people, uh, someone tell another person to go to hell, you don't know what hell is. You don't know what. You don't know what is. You, you shouldn't want to. You shouldn't wish that on anybody. And, and I, I, I think that's one of the great motives why Jesus went to the cross to provide or offer salvation to everybody because of what hell is going to be. So. Revelation chapter 14, verse 12 through 13. Eventually we would get here, wouldn't we, since it was under the title. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I, that's John, heard a voice from heaven saying, Write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Let's make sure that our labors are for the deeds that will help us to get to heaven for 